Open your Bible up to John chapter 1. The Gospel of John chapter 1. Who are you? (laughs) Who are you anyway? Look at someone and say, who are you anyway? You are the most important thing that ever happened to this planet for this day and time. You say, well, I thought Jesus was. Well, Jesus is in you. This is all part of his plan. John chapter 1, talking about John the Baptist. Now, to, to give you a little bit of background here, I'm going to talk to you tonight about who do you say that you are? Who do you say that you are? Okay? Because this is going to make a lot of difference in how the world gets changed. Now, John the Baptist, I don't know if you remember the story or not, Elizabeth, an old woman who was a godly woman, she, she loved God, in her old age... She became pregnant, and uh, her son was John the Baptist. Now, Mary was probably 13, 14 years old, and an angel showed up in her bedroom and said, Hey, you're pregnant. And she said, Yeah, great. Thank you so much. She goes, How's this going to work? I mean, I'm not married or anything. He said, The Holy Ghost will come upon you. I don't know. Have you ever thought about this? What would you tell your mother? I mean, think about that. Think about, she wasn't married, and she was pregnant. What would you tell your mother? Mom, I'm pregnant. <gasps> Who's the guy? God. <laughs> Go to your room, you know? I mean, well, who was she going to tell? This is, this is a hard one, you know? Angel showed up and says, you're going to have a child, and his name will be called Jesus, and he'll save the people from their sins. So she thought, well, I think I'll go on a vacation. I think I'll get out of here for a while because this isn't going to go over too well in my hometown. So she left. She went to see her cousin, who just happened to be Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. Now, so here's Elizabeth. She's pregnant. She's a little bit farther along than, uh, than Mary was. Mary had just found out. So she heads off, and she, she comes to, uh, she's coming up to the house. She says, Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth in the house heard Mary's voice, John the Baptist, as an embryo inside of Elizabeth, started dancing. I mean, this is pretty wild stuff. Mary goes, Elizabeth. John's in there just kicking. He's like, he's here, he's here, he's here. Even before he was born, he had a sense of his destiny. Now, so they're born. John was born, and then later on Jesus was born, and you know that story. But let me, let me show you this here. Let me find it first, then we'll look at it. Starting in verse, let's see, verse 19. John chapter 1, verse 19. Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Look at someone and say, who are you? Verse 20, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ, the anointed one. So they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. And they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? Now look at someone and say, what do you say about yourself? Now look at what John said, verse 23. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. When they asked John, who do you say that you are, he told them what the Word said about him. Now, what does the Word say about you? Look over at Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 2. I want you to see this, underline it, circle it, highlight it, blow it up, Put it on your wall. Write it on your forehead. Tattoo it on your navel. 
This is what the Word says about you. Now check it out. In Acts chapter 2, verse 17, it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, the first thing I want to point out here is, is this last days part. How many of you believe this is the last days? How many of you believe Jesus is coming in your lifetime? You know, he could come any time now. He could come before the year 2000. We've got less than five years till the year 2000. That would kind of wrap it up nicely. Now they estimate that from the time of Adam to the time of Jesus Christ was about 4,000 years. And then from the time of Jesus till now is about 2,000 years because it's almost the year 2000. And I don't know if you realize this or not, the Bible says a day with the Lord is as 1,000 years and 1,000 years is one day. Now if you parallel that fact with creation, Jesus, uh, you know, coming on the fourth day, you know, he rose again on the third day, but when you look at creation, God spoke all the worlds into existence. On the sixth day, he finished all his work, and what did he do on the seventh day? Okay, now follow me here. If a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day, and it's six thousand years from the time of Adam until now, how many days is that? Six days. So what happens on the seventh day? Now the Bible in Revelation says that there's going to be a millennium where there's going to be a rest. A thousand year reign of Christ. That's one day. That's the rest. So we are coming up to the end of the 6,000 year, six day period and getting ready to go into the day of rest, the millennium. The coming of Jesus is very close. Now, some of you get real nervous when we talk about Jesus coming back real soon because some of you are thinking, I want to get married first so bad. How many of you want to get married before Jesus comes back? How many of you are 12? Oh, hallelujah, glory to Jesus. Now, some of you are just real nervous about this. You know? I mean, what would happen? You find somebody that you love. You get married. You say, oh, I do. I now pronounce you man and wife. You may kiss the bride. You walk down the aisle, da, 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 and you're hurrying, because Jesus is coming soon. Da, 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 come on! <laughs> you have cake. <laughs> you know, that's when the girl feeds the guy, and the guy feeds the girl, and they miss. You ever been to a wedding? And you hurry up and eat the cake. <laughs> and then you go out, and you get in the car, and you're going to your honeymoon. You pull up to the hotel in your limousine. The door opens. You get out. You go through those big doors. There's people there welcoming. Welcome. Come in. We'll show you to your room. We'll carry your bags. You get up to the room. You open the door. The guy picks up his bride, carries her through the door. Excuse me. Sorry. Oh. takes her over, sits down, looks into her eyes. I love you. Sick. <laughs> Is that sick? <laughs> Is 
she says, I love you too. <laughs> then the angel shouts and the trump of God sounds and heaven splits wide open and the rapture is occurring. And you go, wait a minute. <laughs> Some of you are really freaked out that that might really happen. You know what? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. God's got it all under control, and it's all going to be just fine. Okay? Some of you get real ner I don't know why. You know, this generation is like glorified marriage like it's the thing, you know? Like it's the only thing. That's not the only thing. There's cooler things than marriage, like heaven. Heaven is much cooler than marriage. If you don't believe me, ask anyone who's married. Heaven is so cool. Heaven is awesome. He in heaven, you think something, you know, like, I'm hungry. <laughs> There's food in your hand. You think it, and it shows up. I read this book about this lady who died and went to heaven and came back and wrote a book about it. And this lady, she got there, and this angel greeted her and gave her this brand-new white robe. And they're walking around, and there's this tree with this huge, beautiful fruit on it. She says, could I have some of that? He says, sure. She takes some of it. She bit into it. It was so juicy that it all just ran down the front of her. And she thought to herself, oh, no, I've, I've soiled my, my beautiful white robe. And she looked down, not a spot. No laundry in heaven. <laughs> I mean, isn't that good news? Aren't you glad? You won't have to wash anything at all. No dishes, no clothes. They were walking along, and they came to a river. And the angel was talking with her and showing her around. The angel kept walking down into the river. So she followed him down, and they got under the water, and they were still talking to each other and breathing under the water in the bottom of the river. Blah, 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 blah. Came up on the other side, and she thought, oh, my, I've got my robe wet. You know, girls, they think about their clothes all the time, you know. She got out the other side, and she says, my, my robe's, and it wasn't wet. Heaven is so cool. You know what? When I get to heaven, I want to ride one of those guys with four faces and six wings and, and wheels. You know, a Harley Angel or something. I don't know what this guy is. But I'm going to ride one of those guys when I get to heaven. Heaven is so cool. Now, these are the last days. God's wrapping up the program. There's a lot of people that need to get saved before Jesus comes back. That's our job. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And, you know, you go to your school and you look around and there are some creatures there, aren't there? Have you noticed that? It's like, ee. Good Jesus loves you. In spite of yourself. And they need that opportunity to hear the gospel and to get saved. These are the last days. So here's the prophecy. Here's what it says about you. When someone asks you, who are you? This is what you can tell them. It says, in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, how many of you are made of flesh? Every single person in here is made of flesh. Yes, you are. You can't fool me. He says, not me. Okay, fly around the room. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll pour my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters, that's you, will prophesy. Well, I haven't prophesied lately. Well, start prophesying then. Go stand in front of your school and say, drugs, get out of my school. Get out. You are not allowed in my school. What are you doing? You're speaking the word of the Lord over that school. Is it God's will that your school be full of drugs? Is it God's will that it be full of witchcraft? Is it God's will that it be full of perversion? Is it God's will that everyone in your school gets touched by the power of God and hears the gospel? Yeah. So... You say the will of God. You speak the word of God over that situation. Stand in front of your school and you say, I declare as a son and daughter of God whose spirit has come upon me, I declare in Jesus' name that no weapon formed against this school can prosper. 
I declare that the Spirit of God who is poured out on all flesh is also poured out on my school. Is that the will of God? Speak it. Prophesy it. Speak it. Proclaim it. And all of a sudden, spiritually, things start to change at your school. You'll notice it. Why? Because you're becoming in tune with it. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. You young men, you're supposed to be seeing some visions. You say, well, you know, like, how, how is a vision supposed to happen? Well, when you spend time praying in the Spirit and getting into the Word, you'll see some things. Every once in a while, heaven will open up to you, and you'll see some stuff that's going on. I mean, it's amazing. The Spirit world is not very far away. God wants you to begin to move into the gifts of the Spirit, like discerning of spirits. And to see what's going on. Now, you've already done this to a degree. How many of you have ever gone into a music store and they're playing the music? And you go in and you feel the heaviness. It's like... <laughs> you just feel dirty. You're just, you, as a spirit-filled young person, you walk into that atmosphere and it just weighs on you. Why? It's not the Spirit of God. It's something else. And you can just sense it. The supernatural world is very real. And in Ephesians chapter 6, when it says, you know, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, because you don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but you wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places, those things are real. Demonic forces over cities, over schools, over areas, they're real. And they'll try and stop you. There's assignments that have been placed against your school and against your city that are not going to be taken out of the way unless somebody stands up and starts proclaiming God's word over the situation instead of all those other words that have been said before. Now, most of you are familiar with a lot of uh, America-type stuff. What do you think of when I say Hollywood? Movies? Marilyn Monroe? Money, film, stars. What do you think of when I say San Francisco? What do you think of when I say New York? What do you think of when I say Miami? What do you think of when I say Tulsa? It's in Oklahoma. Let me tell you what, in the United States, when you say Hollywood, most people think of sex. When you say San Francisco, most people think of gays. When you say New York, most people think of money and greed. When you say Miami, most people think of drugs. And when you say Tulsa, most people think of God. And I'll tell you why. Oral Roberts University is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And Rama Bible Training Center and Kenneth Hagin Ministries is in Tulsa or right outside of Tulsa. And two men with powerful ministries have made a city famous. Now, maybe you haven't heard of it over here. Okay, what city do you live in? And what do people think of when they say your city? Is it drugs? Is it rebellion? Is it alcohol? Is it problems? Is it, you know, whatever it is, you can change it. You can change it. God wants you to change it. Who are you? Who are you? You're the sons and daughters that prophesy to a generation. You're the ones that see visions and dream dreams. I want you to turn in the Old Testament to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17. Let's deal with some more young people. How many of you are young people? Who's 13? Who's 14? Who's 15? Who's 16? Who's 17? Who's 18? Is anyone in here 19? Any 20 year olds? Anyone 21? <laughs> anyone 48? 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let's look at David. 
Starting in verse 1, Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Ezekah and Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He was about ten feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat of mail was about 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had, a bron he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders, and on the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you are the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now let me ask you a question. Who makes the rules at your school? Here's Israel on one side and the Philistines on the other side, and they're facing each other for battle, and Goliath, this big, huge guy with big, huge lips, comes down to the valley, and he yells out to them and says, I defy you. He said, look, we're not going to fight in a battle. You just send out one guy to fight me. Who said Goliath could make the rules? He did. Well, who is he? He doesn't have a covenant with God. He's nobody. He's just some big guy with big feet and big lips. Well, the devil has ruled your school long enough, and the devil has ruled your city long enough. And he doesn't make the rules. But who's going to change it? Let's look at what happened. Verse 22. David left his supplies in the hand of a supply keeper, ran to the army, and greeted his brothers. And as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches, will give him his daughter, will give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Then David's older brother came and rebuked him. How many of you have brothers and sisters? How many of you have older brothers and sisters? You ever gotten rebuked? That's amazing. I have two brothers and two sisters. I have an older brother and an older sister and a younger brother and a younger sister. So it was kind of easy for me. My older brother and sister would beat me up, and then I would turn around and beat up my little brother and sister. It was kind of like a chain reaction. It was kind of nice. I felt sorry, though, for my little brother because he was the youngest, and he got beat up, and there was no one else for him to beat up. So he would, you know, beat up the teddy bear or something. I don't know. But David's brother got on his case... And he said this, verse 28, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And all the people answered him as the first ones. 
Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he went for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine and fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. Now check this out. Here's David, and he's got everything. Everybody is against him. I mean, even when, when Samuel came to anoint him to be the king, he, David had older brothers, like six or seven of them, and Samuel comes and says, I've come to anoint one of your sons as king. So Jesse, the father of David, brought in the oldest. God said, that's not him. He brought in the next one. That's not him. Brought in all of them except David. David was out with the sheep. Brought in all these sons. God said, nope, 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 nope. And they ran out of sons. And Samuel says, is that all? And none of these are it. And God said, one of your sons is going to be anointed king. And Jesse, the father of David, sat there for a minute and went, huh. Now how would you feel if your parents, if someone asked them about you, had to pause for a moment and go, hmm, wait a minute. Yeah, I think I do have another kid. Oh, yeah. Wait a second. Sure, yeah. It's, his name's David. He's out there with the sheep. Samuel says, well, bring him in. We're not even going to sit down and eat until you bring him in. Oh, okay. So they brought David in. The minute David walked in, the Spirit of God came on Samuel and said, that's the one. And David was a good-looking young man, had red hair. I don't know if he had freckles, but he was ruddy-looking. That means he, he looked red. Probably because being in the sun all the time. And Samuel anointed him to be king. Later on, David shows up at this battle, and his brother says, oh, I know how naughty you are. Why don't you just go home and watch those sheep? So his dad forgot about him. His brother didn't like him. And then he goes into the king. And he says, King, don't worry about this giant. I'll take care of him. And the king says, you are not able. You're just a shepherd boy. He's been a man of war from his youth. You are just a kid. How many of you are fed up with being told that you are just a kid? You are not just a kid. You are the generation that's going to change the face of this earth. You are. You got to begin to think like God thinks about you. When they came to John the Baptist, who, who, who are you? So I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He couldn't help it, man. I mean, even when he was in his mother's womb, he had a sense of destiny. He heard the voice of the mother of Jesus, and he was ready to go. David was ready to go, too. Everybody told him he couldn't. The king says, you can't do this. You're just a kid. Look what David said. In verse 34, David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose again against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, look at someone and say, David said. David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. David talked him into it, man. He just talked him into it. Saul, and one minute he's going, you can't, you're just a kid. You're just a kid. You're just a kid. David rose up and said some words. He said, I've killed lions and bears. What have you killed lately? Now check this out. If a lion walked in over here right now, where would you go? Probably over there that, you know, just 
get away. Not David. A lion comes up, grabs one of his sheep. He went up and attacked the lion. Now, something's wrong with this kid. You know what I'm saying? Something's wrong. He's been out in the field thinking about God's word too long. He thinks he can beat anything. He just thinks he can conquer anything. He just thinks he can overcome anything. Because he's sitting there, a lion comes up, and the sheep is in his mouth. A place where you do not want to go. And David went up and he grabbed the lion by the beard. Do you know how close a lion's beard is to his mouth? Would you put your hand there? David grabs him by the beard and looks him face to face and says, You're dead. Beats the crud out of him. Kills him dead. A bear comes along. Takes one of the sheep. He says, No, uh, 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 uh. And he attacks the bear and kills it. Here's a kid that attacks lions and bears. So the next time you're walking through the woods and a koala drops on your head, a drop bear, just play basketball with him. David said, I've killed lions and bears, and this Philistine will be just like that. God delivered me from the hand of the lion and the hand of the bear. He'll deliver me from this Philistine too. And Saul said, go! You know, I mean, it's like a cheerleader deal, you know? He got him fired up. Saul said, go, and the Lord be with you. Saul wasn't going to hold him back. Brian Reynolds, a young man in our youth group, went to his principal at his school. He said, we want to start a Christian club. The principal said, no. He said, we're, we're going to start a Christian club here. She said, no, you're not. He said, well, think about it. They went and they prayed and they stood. He came back to her and says, we need to start a Christian club here at the school. She said, okay. We had a guy in our youth group a long time ago. His name was Fred. And Fred was into computers and stuff. He wanted to start a Christian club at his school. He went to his principal. And he said, I want to start a Christian club at this school. The principal said, no, 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 no. No, we're not going to do any of that here. Fred says, we need to start a Christian club at this school. The teacher said, no, no. Separation of church and mind. <laughs> Didn't even know what he was talking about. There's no such thing as separation of church and mind. There's this thing in the United States that they call separation of church and state where they try to keep religion out of the school by using this phrase. And it's not even in the Constitution of the United States. It's a statement that Thomas Jefferson made when he was trying to make a point that the state should not interfere with church affairs. And our government has taken that and has twisted it and twisted it and twisted it to make it look like you shouldn't have Jesus in the public schools. I mean, they just turned it all around. So this teacher said, no, separation of church and mind. I mean, he didn't even know what he's talking about. So we gave Fred a copy of the Equal Access Act that was passed in 1984, and he brought it in to his teacher and says, okay, I want you to read this. And he read it. He says, is this accurate? Freddie said, yeah. President Reagan put it into action. The principal said, well, I guess you can have one then. Talked him into it. A kid. Just a kid. Started a Christian club at his school, was reaching out to other young people, changing the face of that school, changing it, changing that school. David, you know, I mean, you know the story. Saul says, well, why don't you take my armor? And Saul was like six foot four or five. He was taller than all the other uh, guys in Israel. That's why they chose him to be king, because he was pretty tall. But Saul wasn't going to go fight this 10-foot tall guy. So Saul says, why don't you wear my armor? And David puts on, you ever put on something that just really doesn't fit? Well, David puts on Saul's armor. It's like down to his knees, you know? It looks really stupid. So David says, my fashion sense is getting way out of hand. So he says, I'm not going to wear this stuff. I'm going to take something I'm familiar with. So he took a leather strap and a stick <laughs> to go after a 10-foot guy with. 
You know what? He didn't need a whole lot. You know why? He wasn't trusting in his own ability. He was trusting in God's ability. And when you stand before that principal at your school and say, we need to start something here, you're not going in your own ability. You're going in God's ability. You don't have to talk him into it. God will make it happen. You don't have to make it all happen. God will back you up. But you've got to step out. So here's David. He's coming along. And uh, he comes to the brook, and he picks up five smooth stones. Now let's look at what happened here. Verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. In other words, he mocked him. For he was only a youth. There it is again. Ruddy and good-looking. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Yes. The answer is yes. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, here's the words that are happening here. He says, come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. I'll feed you to the birds, you little twerp. Then David said, then David said, then David said, you got to say something. You can't keep, you can't keep quiet any longer. You got to say something. That David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of hosts and the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands he said something he say yeah but if I say something then what if it doesn't happen well you'll never know until you do you gotta say something you gotta stand out in front of your school and look so dark and ominous you say you know what I own you you think you're in charge of me. Uh-uh. I'm in charge of you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, every demon get out of that school in Jesus' name. And they have to obey you. You stand in front of that school and you say, you come to me with peer pressure and you come to me with all kinds of, kinds of junk and fear. I come to you in the name of my God and I will get drugs and I will get witchcraft and I will get perversion out of you in the name of Jesus. David had some words. You better get you some words. He said, you're just, a little, you're just a little kid. You're just a kid. You're just a kid. You're just a kid. No, you're not. Whoever told you that lied. You are not just a kid. All right, look at what happens. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He didn't waste any time. You'd have probably hid behind a bush and tried to trip the big lug when he came by, you know? Not David, he attacked him. David put his stone... Uh, put his hand in the bag, took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine and his forehead. This is so gross. So that the stone sank into his forehead. <laughs> and the giant fell on his face to the earth. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and took over the Philistine stood over him, took his sword, and drew it out of its sheath, and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Now check this kid out. <laughs> He's out there. He gives the words. He speaks some words. Then he attacks. 
And he just, I mean, I'm surprised he didn't start flying like a helicopter, you know? <laughs> He's just running at the guy. He lets the thing go. You know, and I'm convinced of this because David was not trusting in his own ability. He was trusting in God's ability. It probably would not have mattered which direction he threw that stone because it wasn't his cunning craftiness with a sling. It was the name of his God that he was standing on. What if he'd have done this? Check this out. What if he'd have done this? He's facing Goliath, and he goes, watch this. It sunk into his forehead. That is so gross. And the giant fell down on his face, lips and all. David runs over and jumps up. This is so gross. I mean, you're going to have to get gross if you're going to take over this generation. David runs up and he stands up on the face, just jumps on him. Man, the guy's 10 foot long, you know. He's laying there. David jumps up on him. Ha-ha! Now where are your big words, big guy? Didn't have a sword. Took the giant sword. Can you imagine the giant sword was probably bigger than David? David pulls it out. Probably didn't even have to swing it. Probably just dropped it. Right on his neck. Click. Then check this out. You know, the Philistines start to run. The Philistines had no intention of serving the Israelites. You know, he says, if, if you win, we will serve you. He lied. The devil no, never tells you the truth. They started running. The Israelites started after him. They said, let's get them all. David didn't bother chasing the Philistines. Instead, he reached down, took Goliath's head by the hair, flung it over his shoulder, carried it back to camp. Can you imagine how big this head was? I mean, this guy's 10 foot tall. He's got this big old watermelon head. He's got it over his shoulder. He's carrying it back to camp. His head. I mean, that's gross. If you don't believe me, try coming home with one, you know. Say, Mom, look what followed me home. Can I keep it? <laughs> Came into Saul. Guess who? <laughs> blah, 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 blah. He didn't beat Goliath with a rock. He beat Goliath with his words. He beat Goliath with his words. He spoke words. You're going to have to get you some words. Who are you? You know, people are going to start asking you that when you go to school. You go in and you start preaching. I mean, you're right there in the middle of biology class. You stand up and you go, I don't believe in evolution. You start preaching about the creation of God. They're going to go, who are you? I'm one who is sent from God. I am more than a conqueror. I am part of that generation. I am God sent, anointed, Holy Ghost filled, word walking, believing, conquering, overcoming, son and daughter of God. That's who I am. And who might you be? <laughs> and they'll go, scared. Who are you? The problem with the young generation of today is that they haven't known who they are. John had a sense of his own destiny from the time he was in his mother's womb. God said about this generation, that you will prophesy and signs, wonders, and miracles would occur. I turn over to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Revelation, chapter 1. Here's John, the apostle, on the Isle of Patmos. The story goes this way. John, they couldn't kill him. 
they took John they had they had crucified Peter upside down they had cut off another one of the apostles heads they had they had martyred most of the apostles and they took John and they were going to boil him in oil and they let him down into the boiling oil and pulled it back up and he was still alive they couldn't kill him so they sent him to an island by himself and while he was there he got the book of Revelation Jesus showed up verse 12 of Revelation chapter 1 then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the seven lampstands one like the son of man clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band verse 14 his head and hair were white like wool where does wool come from his head and hair were white like wool as white as snow and his eyes like a flame of fire his feet were like fine brass as it is refined in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters this is a picture of the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb put on the altar, burned. You say, well, Jesus wasn't burned on the cross. No, but he went to hell for you. Hell's full of fire. He was that sacrifice. And the signs and wonders are going to be the manifestation of the presence of Almighty God in your generation. Your sons and daughters will prophesy and I'll show signs in heaven above and the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The glory of God and the presence of Jesus is going to come on this generation and it's going to be awesome. Why haven't we seen more of it? Because young people aren't saying it. They haven't had any words. He said, your sons and daughters will prophesy, and then I will show signs and wonders. They will prophesy, I will show. They will prophesy, I will show. They will prophesy, I will show. If they don't prophesy, I won't show. If David didn't have any words, he would not have won. But he spoke words. He said, I will kill you, I will cut off your head, I will feed you to the birds. Thank you very much. They said, John, who are you? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. And then when they ask us as a generation, who are you? We're going to say, we are the generation of the glory of God and the presence of God is going to come in and it's going to fill up my home, my school, my church. It's going to fill up my city. Can you imagine the glory of God coming down over your city like a cloud, like a thick fog and people can't even walk because it's so thick. It hadn't happened because young people haven't been saying it. How many of you want a revival for your generation? You're going to have to say something. You're going to have to say something. You're going to have to have some words. You're going to have to begin speaking something. You're going to have to prophesy something. You're going to have to have something in your heart. You're going to have to speak it out of your mouth. You're going to have to change the face of things to come by the words that you speak. This is the generation that's going to prophesy the coming of the Lord Jesus in his manifest glory. Stand up on your feet. Spencer and Cindy Nordyke, Reaching Nations and Generations. For more information, visit nordikeministries.com.